Uh, it was at a Linsock meeting, the annual meeting in 1976, that Keith Jones and Arthur Bell said, you know, you need to work on this group of pants. Just spend your life doing that. And so that was sort of an emphasis to me at the meeting. And it was, you know, th another reason, well, you'll see wh how these people affected things. So this is just sort of the title, but it started. And I will tell you, this all started with sort of trying to do some systematics and I couldn't identify anything because the taxonomy was a disaster. And I'm not gonna talk about the taxonomy part so much, but the number in the group was 80 species and there's now 320 that are known and that's from field exploration and not being able to identify anything in living collections. So as I wanna say, it all begins in collections in the herbarium to get localities, et cetera. And this all started with field work. And of course, we all know how these things go. And this is where the, you, know, you end up in remote places, you learn interesting things, and you learn a lot of botany. Well, one of the things that you have to do is maybe you need to learn something about what your group has. So these would be characters that occur in the group that we know after we did the phylogenetic trees, but I want to take it on the front end so that I can talk about those. And you can see what I've listed mostly are things that are structural features and uh, some chemical features. And the point to this is that when you look at these things, since these are structural features, these might be useful also in identifying fossils and bringing that kind of data into it. And cycads have these, and nobody else has these characters. So it's a very good setup. And then there are characters that occur within for clades that are found only in those clades and nowhere else in seed plants. So those also, of course, become a useful construct. And I want to show you what some of these are. Now, this title could also be, this talk could have been titled, How to Terrorize the Horticultural Faculty. <laughs> but this is slice and dice botany. I was a Tomlinson postdoc. You have to do this. But my point is, if you look at that, there's some of those characters I talked about. Here's the omega pattern for the leaf traces, for example. The girdling leaf traces up here. The cone domes in the center. Polyzylic xylem, et cetera. So these are a useful construct uh, if you want to look at these and start to base the phylogeny and look at those things. Now, part of this is the, my botany career. You also, there was a point in, in systematic botany and stuff where you had to do blended botany. You had to do some phytochemistry. So we went down that road, and one of the really cool things in there was these, if you take the polysaccharides, they have this mucilage they produce. It looks like a bad head cold. But if you look at it, it's these polysaccharides that you can hydrolyze into monosaccharide profile, and what you get is a distinct pattern for every genus. This is also, was also useful for identifying smuggled plants at one time, because society's thing protected things at the generic level. So you can go, you're not passing go, you're not getting your $200. The other thing was to look at chemicals like these, which I will come back to. That is the things that are called the manglice sides and this non-protein amino acid. And the non-protein amino acid is the thing that's involved in the neurobiology. But those compounds occur nowhere else. So again, we have chemical markers we can use. And we can take all of that information, can't we, and sort of generate a phylogenetic tree like this and you can actually translate that tree into a classification, or you can go the other way with it. Now, there is some changes with molecular data, but there's only really one that's significant, and uh, I'll point that out a little bit later. Now, this means when you have this good structural data, you can go to the fossils. This is really great. Cycads have fantastic fossils with great preservation. And just to show you some things, this is a drawing of expanse with something called the coronula that was in the list. Here it is in the fossils, these seeds. For example, if you look at the top of those two living encephalardos, uh, megasporophylls, there's the fossil one with that. If that's not the stalk, but that's that thing coming down the adaxial surface. Here's the extant thing in China, and there's the early Permian fossil. So we've got great fossils to work with, and we have a lot of structural data, and uh, we've done a lot with those. You can. Just another example, the omega leaf traces, look at that one in the middle, that's just awesome, these fossils. Same thing with the protozylum poles. Now, this is one thing, lesson about fossils. The thing on the left is a picture of an extant zania cone, and the one in the middle right now is a fossil called benia. It's always presented that way, with these sort of internodes in the cone and everything, and it's always been a little bit enigmatic. Well, one day, I looked at one of my pickled cones, and lo and behold, I could make all the beans I wanted by just letting my pickle jar dry out. 
But a little bit of the point here is sometimes you need to be judicious when you don't understand something and understand the process may cause some artifacts in the fossils. So Bedia may very well have been something that actually dried out when it was fossilized and perhaps really doesn't have a set of good characters for us to use. But fossils give you other neat characters. These perforations in the epidermal cells, for example, we discovered those in fossils and went, wow, what a cool character. And we never looked in the extants, but there's a certain group of extants that have those. So the fossils led us to understanding new characters in the extants. So the end result, you throw the fossils into your data matrix. And this is awesome. Look at that. There's 17 fossils in here, more than the extant. And you get a fairly resolved tree. And then you can begin to look at characters and look at the timing of those, et cetera. So I was pretty excited, and we have even more new fossils. Argentina's like awesome place, not just for wine, but for fossils. <laughs> now I want to talk about another thing that you can learn, because a lot of what we do is here's my tree, and I'm kind of tired of the here's my tree. What are you going to do with your tree? Do something useful. So here's a character about the megaspore fill shapes. You can see this, but this tree would indicate that there's three origins of that, or there's an alternative thing on a delayed transformation, but just stick with this one for the time being. So it looks like there's three origins of these things. And what are they? Well, these are peltate megasporophylls. There's a stalk here that goes in with two ovules on it, the same thing in Encephalardos. So that's one clade, the Encephalardos clade. One of the other clades is that Zamia clade. And we've taken the ovules off, and this is what I mean. The stalk comes out towards you. That's an umbrella. That's what peltate means. So you're going, OK, that's a homoplasy. Well, you know, homoplasy is about ignorance. It doesn't exist in nature. It's just our ignorance of understanding what we're looking at. Well, I decide, OK, I'll look at this development. I'm not going to take you through the details other than the thing with the stalk, the zanium ones actually have a primordium that's a stalk, and then there's like a ring mare stem that develops an umbrella. The encephalitis clay has a stalk with an adaxial mare stem on this side. And it bulges down here because those cones are from compression. But it gives us the same looking structure. And of course, the tree was telling us they don't have the same history. There are different ways to do it. This is from Marie Stokes' dissertation, by the way, over there. So we now know we can get rid of the homoplasy issue. But there's the third one. What is Bowedia? Is that a third way of doing it? I always thought, well, you know, I don't have the developmental material. In the end, I didn't need it because when you do the molecular tree, Bowenia moves from that position to, to the sister taxon to these, which just tells me it's another one of those compression things in the cone with the adaxial growth, and its vasculature is identical. When you have the adaxial growth, you just have a bunch of bundle proliferation in that part, but not in the squished part. So we got rid of the homoplasy, and we know there's more than one way of doing that. Now, because I was at Q with Jones, and I wanted to go to the London Welsh Club, I had to squish some chromosomes. Reduce supply spec botany. And I'm not going to go into this in detail, but there's just incredible changes in chromosome numbers. And these numbers go from 18 to 28 within one species with these odd numbers. How do these things do? It's because every one of these numbers has exactly the same number of chromosome R minutes. So the way I did these circles is you can either do Robertsonian fissions. So if you took one of these metacentrics and you did a fission on it, you would get one chromosome number increase of one. Or the Robertsonian fusions is the other way. So you take two telocentrics and fuse them into a metacentric. The number goes down by one. So the real question here was, is it fission or is it fusion? And this is where the trees came in. That's what I thought was so cool. So we did this zamia phylogeny. And what you see here is that every there's multiple instances. But you can see the, the uh, sister taxon in every one of the clades that have these high numbers has 2n equals 16, indicating that fusions are the process that have gone on repeatedly within the genus. And I'll tell you, they're all fertile because the numbers are the same. So if you two telos can pair a, next to a metacentric or vice versa, right? So it's, it's a viable situation. <coughs> now I want to go one other place. So I talked about those cycad synapomorphs. So I want to talk about this BMAA, which is a non-protein amino acid. And that defines the group. And there's one other place that it's known, and that's in cyanobacteria. And believe me, you don't want to go eat in these plants. Well, it actually plays a role in the pollination biology. So cycads were thought to be wind-pollinated. 
But if you look in the first thing, if you dig in the leaf litter, you find a cone like this full of seeds. And we knew there had been no hurricanes that year in Florida. And we also knew the lizards weren't doing it. But the seeds were good. So we said, okay, what's going on here? This was with Knut Norstad, one of the finest people I've ever known. So we noticed the cones opened up for a day. And we also noticed that male cones had these little holes in the end and these weevils on the outside of them, as you see on the bottom left. So we just took some unopened cones, put them in jars, and got all these weevils out. So we went, aha, there's something going on here. And I just have to breeze through this very quickly. But basically, we were able to demonstrate that these coculionid weevils spend their life in the cycad cones. So the really cool thing they do is uh, if you start with a cone, from the previous year, they have a diapause phase. They come out of diapause when the first males come. And as adults, they run over and they have sex on the female cones. So they copulate there. And they run around the inside, but they never feed on them. Then they go back and they oviposit in the male cones. Okay, so we've got this, so you have to bear with me for a moment. So what happens is that they go through and they do this diapause thing. And one of the things about the non-protein amino acids is, is if you're an insect eating it, you would incorporate it into your tertiary protein configuration, which would end your life cycle. So you go, and what do they do with this? How do they do this? The only bugs that can really, as chewing insects besides a butterfly, live on these plants. And it's very simple. This BMAA is produced in these things we call gold cells that you see with a razor blade section. And if you localize the BMA, you see it's there. And what they do, they give you some matchment, and then this stuff in the female cones is dispersed in the tissues, but in the male cones, it's never dispersed. The walls get thick, there's no plasma desmata. And what these guys do is when they eat that and consume male cone tissue, they excrete the gold cells into the cocoon cells and make their cocoons toxic. And they have no problem, so it goes all the way through the gut. And you can just sort of track it uh, through staining techniques. <clears throat> so this is a precise thing. These weevils live on them for a month. Some of them go into diapause. They hang out till next year, and they come out, and they go through this whole life cycle. So we have an insect pollination thing, which was kind of cool to come up with. But there's another thing about this plant, this compound. BMA is called a glutamate agonist. You can see the similarities in the uh, structure with glutamate. Now, glutamate is a functional thing in terms of your neurobiology and your neurons working. So I'm going to give you a simplified, because I don't understand it in depth, explanation of this. But we were asking ourselves some questions. <clears throat> and the way it works is if that's your neuron with the firing and glutamate goes to a site and then released back into a pool, good old BMAA goes there, it sticks there, it never lets go, and the neuron does this stuff and it keeps firing until it croaks, right? And we knew in Guam people were eating cycads and there was these high incidences of all these neuro Guam dementia, you know, the, the stuff of Island of the Colorblind by Oliver Sacks. So we were going, that's cool. Maybe that got these guys. <laughs> Eating too many cycads is not good for you or your lineage. <clears throat> but I have a person working on nitrogen fixation I work with at NYU. She's going, I'm interested in this glutamate agonist because of the nitrogen. So we put an Arabidopsis seedlings on there with the BMA in it. And lo and behold, you could give them all the light you wanted in the world, and they looked like one of those little bean plants you did in the third grade in the closet. So we realized that, that uh, plants have what are called gluar genes, or glutamate receptor genes in them, right? And that this is a commonality with plants and animals. And it's actually, you can label the gluar genes, and they're actually in the veins. And if I gave you a section, it's actually in the sit tube elements which is continuous throughout the plant. So you come to a peculiar notion here that if you look at gene trees, there's a set of blue R genes for plants and a set for animals, and there are some known from bacteria. So that's the commonality of genomes. We share 70% of our genome with plants. Maybe in Washington, D.C., it's more like 90%. But <laughs> So long distance signaling via glial R receptors like we use, but they also occur in plants, telling the plants, there's enough light here, you can start to grow. 
and we're getting somewhere with this. So we went around, you know, and they did like the plant torture unit where they did weird things to them to try to get DMAA insensitive plants that didn't respond to it. And there's a reason for this. So you get those, <coughs> and you can ask yourself some questions if you use these. I'm not going to read this, but you can go through that. How can the cycads do it and not be affected, et cetera? And there are implications for this. Well, yes, there are implications for this. You get the gene out from the BMNA insensitives. You still have to cut all that in plant. And you can do this kind of experiment. You can actually put it in the membrane of an oocyte, and beforehand you can measure the responses across it, and then with the BMA present, and it gets shut down. But if you put the gene into that oocyte from the Arabidopsis mutants, you recover about 70% of function. So that means you've got ways of doing this. We're going down science fiction land right now, a little bit. I don't want to do that. I want to go back. I don't want to do that either. <clears throat> I want to do this. All I want to say about this is that the notion is that they would like to get these because they could put them in stem cells to deal with Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS. People with ALS could get new stem cells in the nervous system, but in four or five years they'd have the problem. But if you knew, understood this system, you could program that so it actually worked. This isn't anything I ever thought about doing. <laughs> But you know, this is passed off now to the medical community. But it's, part of my talk is here, you never know where you're gonna end up and you never know where you're gonna go when you start working on something. Now the point that we are at now is just, this is the genomics world that I'm sort of into in a big way. And if you look at this cladogram up here, this is a transformation series in leaves from simple penny to branched once to branched many times in taxa. It's a transformation series. But the really cool thing is, where's the picture? Well, the really cool thing I'm going to tell you is this species, when you start a seedling, the first leaf is simple, the second leaf is once to two times divided, and every leaf substance becomes more and more divided. So not only do you have a transformation series between taxa, you have a transformation, that it's recapitulating in the life of every seedling, which means if you want to study that, you look at leaf two versus leaf three developmentally and in terms of transcriptomes to sort of understand leaf diversity. That's a way to look at Marsilia group too. <clears throat> and finally, because we have all this DNA, you're gonna, what are you going to do with it, you know, because there's a real world out there. And one of the things is DNA barcoding. And DNA barcoding gets some good press, some bad press, but for this group of plants it's great because when they smuggle the plants now, we can just take the DNA barcodes and say, okay guys, you know, you're in trouble. And it's very simple. If you just look at the color codes here, all you have to do is know the genera. So there's uniquenesses to the genera, and then in the top left, there's actually uniqueness within some of the species. So we have an easy tool, a good tool, using the same DNA that we're using all the way along through all the other work. And as an end, the last thing for me is, I think of all this stuff, probably the most useful thing I've done in my career is to generate flora treatments. As soon as I did this flora treatment, we found eight new species because the keys didn't work on them, people bring them in. And things like this for the IUCN where you can do action plants. So I think these things bring it all together and people will be using those keys a long time after I'm dead. So anyway, that's sort of my little thing about where you might end up where you didn't think you would when you started. So thanks. Thank you.